reason why I worship his majesty is different from many in my time. Oh, you don't recognize me with this attire on. You know me. It's a little embarrassing, but I'm the disciple that was mentioned more than any of the other disciples. In fact, I was mentioned more than all of the disciples combined. You don't know that, but you may have remembered me as the one who walked on water. As Jesus beckoned me off of the boat or onto the water. I'm the one that held Jesus down when he had multiplied the fish and the loaves for 5,000 and they wanted another free fish sandwich and he didn't want to make them one so they all walked away. Then he looked at the disciples and said, you want to leave too? And I'm the one, if you remember, who spoke up and said, where are we going to go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. I... I'm the revelation disciple, the one, if you remember, near Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And while everyone there was stuck on stupid, I got a revelation that changed everything. I looked at him and I said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He looked at me and said, you're not that smart. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but it was my father in heaven which gave you that revelation. I'm, I'm, I was his star pupil with a touch of gangster in me. If you remember when the high priest attempted, his servant attempted to put his hands on Jesus, I sliced his ear off. I admit it was a little hasty, but, but, but all good leaders need a few folks with a little gangster left in them. With all the glories, I've been known to put my foot in my mouth from time to time. I think you figured out by now, you, you go to Antioch, so I'm sure you're AP Bible students, and you figured out by now that I am the disciple Peter. As I mentioned, my motivation for serving my king and worshiping his majesty differed from many of the others in my own time. While most of you think that the expectation of the Messiah figure or king in around the first century, the second temple period, was the same, all of the Jews were not expecting the same thing but differed in their messianic expectations. If I could transport you back in time, come with me about 2,000 years, you would see a plethora of groups with varying interests and expectations. It was not a simplistic time back there and society and philosophy and thought has become more complex now in 2018, the time that you live in. But the reality is, even in my own time, there was the depth of thought, complexity of thought. In fact, we thought a lot deeper than most of you today. It was not some archaic, time, but there were competing worldviews, and in our ethnicity, everyone was looking, or many were looking for the Messiah. You've heard of them, they were the most popular. You, you've heard of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the most influential of all the groups that lived in this time. You've heard of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, just a brief introduction to them, they, they were committed to the teaching and the interpretation or living out of the Mosaic law. Not only did they give themselves to the law, they gave themselves to the writings, to the prophets, and to an oral tradition that they called the Talmud, where they collected these oral traditions. They believed in the resurrection of the dead and the afterlife. They kept strict adherence to the tradition. They would wear phylacteries on their heads. You could identify them from a mile away as they kept strict adherence to the traditions and they despised 
anyone being influenced by external core, uh, the co culture, they separated themselves as separated ones from all of those things. As it relates to their expectation of Messiah, they wanted a Messiah who kept their interpretation, the way they viewed the law perfectly without violation of their tradition. One who would overthrow the Roman Empire and restore God's kingdom back to earth. Restore the seat of David back to the physical earth. His reign would be there in their estimation. But their arch rivals, the Sadducees, were a little bit different. The Sadducees were another sect with a different mindset. They were the elite who were historically comprised of the high priestly caste. They interpreted the Torah literally, rejecting oral traditions, the writings, and the prophets, they took it literally and they used their influence or their high standing, their elite status to build political alliances with Rome for their own, often for their own benefit. They were in many respects naturalists, you know, folks who did not believe in the resurrection of life or death or life after death. People who didn't want it to be too spiritual. Their expectation of the Messiah, I don't know that they were actually looking for a Messiah. They wanted leadership that was not too mystical or too overly spiritual. I don't have time to talk through what sect some of us in this place would be in if we lived in the time of Jesus. But based on today, there are some folks that are just like the Sadducees who are okay as long as it's natural and practical, but they don't want it too spiritual or too experiential. They had a theology that was grounded in practical matters with, and again, wanted a leadership that would appreciate the benefits of friendship with the Roman Empire. Not only were there the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but another group lived in that day. The group that lived in that day were the Essenes. Make sure you're listening. Say Essenes. Essenes lived in reclusive communal communities. They, they were kind of like the monks of our day. Anybody familiar with monks? They abstain from sensual pleasure to pursue spiritual goals. Many of them were celibate. If you uh, don't fall into that category, look at your neighbor, tell them I sh certainly couldn't have been in a scene. <laughs> testify, testify. The Essenes believed that they alone possessed the truth. And they rarely integrated with the broader society. What they expected from Messiah King was different than any of the others. They took a dualistic approach and entertained the idea of, interesting to me, multiple messiahs. The idea that one would serve as priest and the other one would serve more as a king multiple messiah. You're beginning to see a sense of the picture over 2,000 years ago. It was not, again, a monolithic expression, but it was one of variety. There were the Pharisees. You got them. You have the Sadducees. You understand who they were. You had the Essenes, the monks of their time, and then you had the Zealots. Who were the Zealots? The Zealots were nationalistic revolutionaries who believed that fire should be met with fire and that change should be brought on by any means necessary, including violence. In fact, they welcomed it. What they expect from, of a Messiah. They expected a Messiah who was a king who would overtake the Roman Empire, not through negotiation, but overtake the Roman Empire by force. The vast majority of people that lived in that time were just common folks like me 
who just wanted the suffering to stop and the quality of life and faith to be livable, ordinary people. Now, while we have all of these folks, all of these characters that live in that day and age, not all of them saw the Messiah like I saw the Messiah. Not all of them called him his majesty. In fact, Isaiah paints the picture, the portrait of a Messiah who was unsuspecting, one that came in under their nose. He didn't come in grandeur or he did not come in splendor, but he slid in right under their nose and they missed him. Here's the challenge with most. The Pharisees had a challenge with him because he was not exclusive enough. Yeah, he, he was unusual. He didn't do what everyone else did, but he was not exclusive enough. He had disciples that followed him, but he also allowed strange folks, like some of y'all. He allowed tax collectors, the lowest of the low, the scum of the land. Some of you don't like the IRS. Trust me, this was the IRS with no rules and no restraint. He let, allowed tax collectors who practice evil before they met him to come into his ranks. He allowed sinners to come near. He didn't require them to be completely changed before he interacted with them, but he allowed sinners to come near. In fact, Jews and Samaritans did not even interact. They could not stand one another, but Jesus would be found talking to Samaritans little scandalous. He one time got caught speaking with a Samaritan woman by a well by himself. Now, first of all, a teacher shouldn't have been with a woman alone. A Jew shouldn't have been with a Samaritan. And here Jesus violates both of those rules. And not only was it a normal Samaritan woman, but she was a little bit of hoochie in her. As Jesus began to speak to her, uh, she, she said, lady, where's your husband? She said, well, well, uh, she started stuttering. Jesus says, you don't have a husband, you have had five. And the one that you're living with now, the one you're in the house with now is not even your husband. Then she gets real spiritual. I perceive you're a prophet, praise God. She was probably trying to get at him right before that. Listen, <laughs> Jesus allowed. Samaritans and Gentiles. He was not exclusive enough for the Pharisees. Not only was he not exclusive enough for them to recognize him as their Messiah, but he was not pious enough for them. They, he did not wear the same garb. He did not adorn himself externally the same way. He broke custom sometimes by allowing his disciples to take part in religious activity without washing themselves and becoming ceremonially clean. He used to say crazy things like revolutionary things like I mean, crazy stuff like it's not what happens on the outside of a man that makes him righteous or unrighteous, but it's what's on the inside of his heart that makes him righteous or unrighteous because he knew they could wash themselves up and still be scoundrels on the inside, but he knew that his folks would not have to keep all the customs, but would still be right in God's sight. He was not pious enough for the Pharisees. He did crazy stuff. What kind of crazy stuff. He healed on the Sabbath and then showed the importance of the saving an individual life on the Sabbath even when there were those who wanted him to keep the tradition and overlook those that needed it the most. He was not pious enough for the Pharisees. But then finally, Jesus had no plan to overthrow the Roman Empire at that moment. He kept on talking weird stuff. They were waiting for him to set up a kingdom out there, but he would say stuff like this. 
The kingdom of God does not come with careful observation. You will not say here it is or there it is. You will not be able to point to a physical kingdom of God. He said for the kingdom of God is within you. They were worried about what it looked like out there and Jesus started talking about what was going on in here. So the Pharisees missed it. But not only did the Pharisees miss him, the Sadducees missed him. The Sadducees missed him because the, he was messing with their status. See, some of us are cool until Jesus. And being identified with Jesus starts messing with our status. You remember the words before they led him to be crucified. They said, if we don't stop this man's teaching, we will lose our place. Very significant to understand that their place was a seat of influence in the Roman Empire and so they were able to maintain status within their own community and have some peripheral status in the greater Greco-Roman context. So Jesus comes and people start flocking toward him and calling him king. They realize that if people start calling him king, Caesar's going to get word of it and destroy all of them. They said if we allow him to keep being called king, King, we're going to lose our place. We're going to lose our status. They were too in love with the worldly kingdom to give place to God's kingdom. That was, that was their problem. They, they condemned heaven's king to death for another uninterrupted moment on the earthly pleasures that they were pursuing. And the truth of the matter is some in this place, you would not kill Jesus to do away with him, but if necessary you will shove him to the side if you have to in order to get ahead I'm talking to my closet Christians in the building uh, I, I heard that this is a custom of yours we didn't do this in the first century but I heard it's a custom of yours can you how do you say it can you can you turn to your neighbor uh, and tell them don't let status cause you to miss Jesus. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Oh, they do do that here, they do that here, they do that here, they do that here. Yeah, yeah. The problem with the Essenes and the reason that the Essenes could not see him as savior because Jesus was not isolated and abstinent enough to be their priest, nor was he glorious enough to be their end time eschatological king. Number two, he messed with their dual idea of a Messiah because they believed that one would be a king, the other would be a priest, but Jesus came on the scene with his message, which was revolutionary. He did not give them the option of having two or three or multiple messiahs. Jesus started coming on the scene saying crazy stuff like, I am the way. In other words, if you're looking for two or three of me or multiple people to play the role, please understand I am not a way, I am not a door, I am not a opening, I'm not a path amongst paths. He said, I am the way. And he messed up their claim on truth possessed by them alone because not only did he say, I am the way, he also said, I am the truth. And if they had kept rocking with him, they would have realized soon that he was also the life. Now, I know this doesn't have any contemporary relevance to you because you don't live in a day and age where everybody just does what they want and still gets God's glory. But if I have any folks who are not in the category of the Essenes and still believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, let me hear you make some noise in this auditorium. They, they told me about you. Yeah, they told me that 2,000 years after he died and paid the price, 2,000 years after the first century, there would still be some folks in this day and age who would not be budged or pulled by popular culture, but would stand their ground declaring and believing that he is, was, is, and will be who he said he was, is, and will be. Look at your neighbor real quick. Is that how you do it? And say, I'm standing 
stand my ground. Then, then he had problems with the zealots because the zealots were ready for blood from the oppressors. They were tired of being under the foot of the Roman Empire and they wanted blood for it. And he was talking about turning the other cheek and overcoming stuff with love. Are you kidding me? What kind of Messiah is going to show up talking about turn the other cheek? And we're going to overcome this with love. He was too much of a pacifist for them to bow down and call them his Messiah. The challenge with them, please forgive me, is he had too much Martin and not enough Malcolm in him. So they said, that can't be our king. I know I'm going to mess up this club right now. Is that what you say, how you say it in this day and age? But there are some who are done with the Christian way way following Jesus' model because external condition have driven the love out of your heart and you've been lured into force in order to turn things around. But it was not only right and authoritative in Jesus' day, Martin Luther King also understood this. And the same kingdom principle Jesus stood on and King stood on, the church of God is going to have to stand on today because it's not confrontation physically that's going to bring about change in our land. It is the resurgence of act love that will cause us to champion kingdom principles. Now I know I just divided the house. Some people are ready to riot. Are you with me? And to beat folks up. Uh, sometimes there's a need for protest but other times, even in our protest the motivation is love. It is not to create greater separation where there's been separation but it is to draw the people of God together so that there can be glory global transformation and I don't need you to clap now I need to discern the real saints from people that have a mixture of world views and philosophies will the real saints please stand up and be seen I just want to make sure I'm in the right place people that still know which kingdom they're in still know which kingdom they serve that no transformation can still happen through love my love may make me active my love may make me protest my love may make me work to change those but my motivating factor is love Look, if that shoe turned a few people before you take your seats give them a high five and tell them we're in the right place we're in the right place we're in the right we're in the right place Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I respect everyone's expectation. But that is not what made the kind of king that I needed most. I'm Peter. And while I praise God for all that, that is not the king that I needed most. It is not the reason that I call him majesty. It is not for earthly treasures that I glorify his name. It is not because he overthrew an oppressive empire that I call him your majesty. But can I tell you, just take for a few moments, I know that they've created something called brunch in 2018 from what I understand. And I know that many of you have to get to Easter brunch. But just before you go to Easter brunch, if you don't mind me taking a moment to tell you what I like about his kingdom and why I call him your majesty. What impressed me about his kingdom was that he didn't limit it to a singular ethnicity. But that he opened the door to whosoever will. He allowed them to come. What I liked about his kingdom is that he did not recognize the elite and disqualify the lowly. The, some of the church needs to hear that today because we've prioritized the elite while we've neglected the lowly.
But Jesus says, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And there's some lost elite and there's some lost lowly. And what I love about the kingdom of God is he didn't discriminate against either or because he realized that everyone was poor as it relates to the deficit of their spirit. The thing I like about this kingdom is, and this king is, he didn't withdraw from society like the scenes, but he knew how to both retreat and to party at the same time he knew how to get away to the mountain to seek the face of God but when he finished seeking the face of God he knew how to walk back up into Jerusalem and ask where the party at and in the middle of the party and he threw some good ones he was at some good ones in fact there was one party where they ran out of drinks and everyone already was a little bit tipsy you don't believe me the custom was to bring the good stuff stuff out first and then once everyone had their fill too much then bring out the cheap stuff like some of you guys do but when Jesus turned water to wine they said he saved the best for last which meant everybody already got it in when Jesus kept the party going are you still here with me but what I noticed about him whether he was on the mountaintop in the temple or in the club he still kept the anointing of the living God on him and he had a purpose like nobody's business look at your neighbor tell them neighbor I'm not judging where you go I just want to make sure you keep the anointing on your life I'm not policing what movie you walked into or what atmosphere you go to on a regular basis but I want to make sure before you go that you are on assignment here's what I like about my king my king did not come in with an iron fist but rather with a servant's heart he said stuff like we don't lord it over them like the Gentiles do he said but rather if you want to be called greatest in my kingdom the greatest in my kingdom will get down on their knees and wash their disciples feet do I have any folks in the house who are servants of the king that's why I call him your majesty he did not come with a chariot but he came riding on a donkey that's why I call him your majesty he, he had no legions of soldiers but rather he had a band of fishermen and rejects I feel like having church right now I don't know if y'all ready to do it but I am he, he did not have again a legion of soldiers but he had a band of fishermen and rejects he had no golden crown or scepter but rather a crown of thorns he said that is my kingdom to suffer on behalf of those that I love he had no scepter in his hand but rather a spear in his side that's why I call him your majesty he not did not overthrow the physical empire but overthrew the hearts of men who needed to be overcome because their hearts were filled with evil that's why I call him your majesty but you ask him why I worship him the way that I do now some of the young folks in here this is swag church I see it uh, but you may not get this I, this is for a few folks in this place that have been walking with him for a long time now I don't want to divide this house and sing the entire song all I want to do is give you the first verse and you'll know exactly where I'm going if I could sing and I wasn't a fisherman or a preacher I would sing it for you but since you grew up on it you already know my testimony if you want to sing it you can sing it but but if you just want to roll with me you can roll with me but the reason the primary reason I call him your majesty is because I was sinking deep in sin I 
I can't finish the rest. Not enough people know it. But, uh, but while we sing the general song, if I could get specific, if we can take this from objective to making it subjective real quick, let me tell you where I've been. Because if no one else will testify in this place, I know it's not a church, but I heard the church wasn't the building anyway. I heard that we were the church and wherever the sole of our foot treads, that is where the spirit of the living God is. And so you may have to free someone up because they're in high school mode right now. If you elbow your neighbor real quick, tell them we've just transformed Polly's Auditorium into the house of the living God. I needed that so I could be a little bit more comfortable telling my testimony. I didn't just sin, but Christ looked at me the day before he hung. And he said, there are some of you that will betray me. I spoke up and said, I surely won't, Jesus. If everybody walks away from you, I'm going to be the one that holds you down. Jesus looks at me and said, uh, you will deny me three times before the rooster ever crows. And I said, the devil is a lie. But I struggled with it because Jesus said it. And everything he said up until that point had been true. And so with conviction in my heart, I sliced the ear off of the high priest's servant when they went to go take Jesus. But interestingly, something happened as they walked him away. As they walked him away to be crucified, it was cold, so I tried to warm my hands by the fire. And as I attempted to warm my hands by the fire, uh, Jesus was popular. He'd been on the cover of Charisma magazine in time, in the height of his popularity, and just the week before you call it I believe Palm Sunday they, the whole crowd crashed in on him and not only did they recognize him but they recognized us as his entourage I mean if you can't be the man you may as well be around the man and so I thought that by now because he had decreased in popularity everyone would have forgotten about me but as I was there trying to blend in with the crowd they saw something on me they said aren't you the one that was in the background on Jesus's Instagram photo that that selfie he took the other day I looked at him and said I get that all the time you must be mistaking me for someone else but they wouldn't leave me alone they asked me again and they they forced my hand I felt a little convicted my my stomach had butterflies in it but I was worried about what it meant to be associated with him because he did tell us that being associated with him we would experience loss and I was okay with my level of loss my level of loss was I walk away from my fishing business but I wasn't to the super saint status yet I will walk away from some things but I wasn't ready to be put to death yet so my love had limits are you with me so when they asked me a second time I told them I had no idea what they were talking about and as they pressed more I became more adamant and intense I, I even surprised myself they asked me a third time and when they asked me the third time something unusual happened now you guys give me a bad rap I, I, you say that Peter was a cusser I did not curse uh -uh. I did not speak in expletives or with expletives. That is not what the Bible meant when it said that I swore. What actually happened is I took upon myself the Jewish oath. And here's what I said. In essence, may God damn my soul if I know that man, Jesus. In fact, I didn't even say his name. I was trying to blend in so much that I said, may God damn my soul or may curses fall on me if I know that man. 
I couldn't even say his name because if I had to said his name, I might not have been able to get the rest of the statement out. As the word says, there is uh, there are many names to be named, but at the name of Jesus, things begin to happen. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. There is no greater name given to man but the name of Jesus. There is power, as the old folks used to sing, wonder working, power in in the name and in the blood of the Lamb. If I had a said Jesus, I may have tore up the club, but I was so convicted that I say, said, may God curse me if I even know that man. Now the point of me saying that is many of you in this place have been low. Has anyone ever sinned in this house? Just wave back at your boy to make sure I'm not the only one. Or well, you never sinned like I've sinned. Let me tell you how I've sinned. Here's how I've sinned. I sinned so bad that I said, may God curse me if I know Jesus. Now I know some of you have smoked it. I know others have drank it. I know others have laid with it. Some have parted with it. You over here have dropped it like it's hot. Uh, you over here uh, went home and never came back. But nobody in this place has been as low as me to where you said, well, God curse me if I'm even identified with Jesus. But may allow me to digress just for a moment. While I was at my lowest, Jesus Jesus was at his best. If that's your testimony, high five somebody real quick. You don't have time to tell them your full testimony. But if you will testify and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. High five somebody, tell them I have a testimony. And if your testimony is like mine, when I was at my lowest, he was at his best. It did not just start when I was at my lowest, but the nature of God is that when you are at your lowest, God is always at his best. It did not just happen with my fall, but it happened with the first fall. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned before God, God did not run from them. God did not back away from them. But after they sinned, my Bible says that God kept calling out for them. He kept reaching out for them. As they were hiding, he kept on walking toward them. I'm trying to go on, but somebody in this place ought to testify that when I was away from God, God kept pursuing When I felt unlovable, God still loved me. When some of the people around me disqualified me and wouldn't even speak my name for embarrassment, there's one person that still called my name in his name. Give somebody a high five, tell them neighbor. Oh neighbor, I don't care how low you are. He's still calling your name. And when I was at my lowest, he was at his best. When I was at my lowest, he was being wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And when every time he was whipped, I was healed. Grab somebody by the hand. Tell him when I was at my lowest, he was at his best. The Bible said, when I was in sin, he who knew no sin became my sin. He didn't just take my sin, but he became my sin. What does it mean? It means that when he died, my sin died. Look at your neighbor till my sin died. It is not coming back. You can try to remind me of it, but it's not coming back. You could have the tape, but it's not coming back. You could have the picture, but it's not coming back. My sin, 
earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust heat. When he said it was finished, it was done. Give somebody a high five. It's, oh, that's my testimony. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. That's my testimony. My testimony. He went to the grave. And when he went to the grave, he went into a solo battle. He faced death, hell, and the grave. But he came out unstung because the sting of death is sin. But because he had no sin, he jumped into the match and wasn't hit with a punch. Got up with all power in his hand. And the reason I bless his holy name is because when he got up, he broke my sin. When he got up, he broke my shame. When he got up, he broke my weakness. When he got up, he kept on making a way for what I did, for what I'm doing, and for what I'm about to do. Look at somebody, tell him he got up, he got up. So I could get up again. He rose so that I could rise. He got up so I could be lifted up. Somebody ought to bless the name of your Redeemer. If you praise him for nothing, you ought to praise him that he got up. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't call him king because of the land he's gonna give me. I don't call him king so that I can promote an elite status in society. I don't call him king because he's overthrown all of my earthly problems. But I call him king because he saved my soul, because he made me whole, because he gave me a new start, because he opened a door that nobody can close. He closed the door that nobody can open. I praise him. I call him majesty because he's... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor, some neighbor. We may not be praising him for the same thing. We may not be praising him that he overcame the same sin. We may not be praising him because we have the same battles. But we can agree on something that he's worthy of all the praise. I dare you to grab somebody by the hand and say, oh, magnify the name of the Lord with me. Let us.
My shame is gone. My guilt is gone. My pain is gone. I serve a resurrected, a resurrected. Somebody in this house, bless the name, bless the name, bless the name, bless the name of, of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 We serve a risen Savior. Don't let anybody take the resurrection away from you. Don't let anybody take the victory away from you. Testify to somebody, he got up, which means you can get up. I don't care what's had you down. The Bible said the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. I don't know where I am, but I'm getting up. We're done, but here's my call. Everyone standing just for a moment. I got a little excited about the goodness of my Savior. I don't want to miss my assignment. My assignment is twofold. There are some people like me, like Peter, who have your heart's right, but you looked up. Sometimes the trials of life, the pressures of the people around you, are the temptations have come your way. You look up and you'll be so far from the path used to be on. For others, you say, I've never been on the path, but I, I feel so far away from God's intention, his intent for my life. I love this because the Bible shows no one at that moment has ever gone lower than Peter in this place. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've gone. I don't care the mistakes you, about the mistakes you've made. You have not drifted that far. This call is for those that are in this place who need to know that while you're hiding, while you're running, God's still calling your name. He's still saying, I want you. He's still saying, I love you. And here's the beauty about Peter. God knew about the fall before the fall and orchestrated the comeback before the slip up. Christ knew about the fall before the fall, but orchestrated the comeback before the slip up. When he looked at Peter before they he ever died, and he said, Peter, Satan's asked that I could sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. But when you turn back, which means that when you stumble, I pray that you won't fall, but when you do stumble, What's the difference between a stumble and a fall? A fall is that you go down for the count and never get back up, never change it, never turn around. There's some people in this place, you've called a stumble a fall and a fall a stumble. But I've come to declare to you in this place, as long as there's breath in your body, you did not fall. You stumbled. God, I feel it. You stumbled. There, there's somebody in this place. You, you have not fallen, but you've stumbled. He says, when you turn back from what? From stumbling, from denying me. He said, strengthen the brothers. He said, in other words, before you ever fall, I saw it. And for somebody in this place, God declares that before you ever dropped the ball, before you ever messed up, I saw it. 
I knew it before you did it. I knew before you messed up. I knew before you faced the consequence. But here's the good part about me. I orchestrated your comeback before the slip up. I orchestrated your comeback before you even had it in your mind to mess up the way that you messed up. I ordered your steps in this church today. This wasn't your idea. This was my idea to bring you back to the path I had for you. That's you in this place. Every high head bowed. Every eye closed in this house. Listen to me, my brother, my sister. I'm not going to embarrass you or put the microphone in your face. But if that is you, you're here. You say, that's me. Pastor, I know I need life change. I know I need some things turned around. I've tried to do it by myself. What we don't realize is that the resurrected Savior rose from the dead to empower you to overcome the things that have held you bound with other people that are empowered to, to overcome the things that have held us bound so if you're here you say pastor that's me number one I need Christ in my life or number two I just know I need change I need to find my way back to the path if that's you don't be ashamed don't be embarrassed I'm not going to embarrass you the lights are down nobody's looking at you now but me Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, you're here, you say, Pastor, that's me. I came to this and you spoke just to me. I want you to lift your hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Shoot that hand up. God bless you. God bless you, man. God bless you, man. God bless you. This was all for you. It was all for you. It was all for you. God bless you. Lower your hands for a moment. Secondly, if there's anyone in this place, you don't have a church family, a church home, we didn't throw this to try to make church members. If this is not your place, we want to help find you a place. But if you know that you need a church family and a church home, if you're here, that's you. I want you to lift your hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. If you want to make this your church family, church home, or you know you need a church family, church home, just, just lift your hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. God bless you. Listen, this is for you. God bless you, man. God bless you. I see you up there. God bless you. God bless you. Now lower your hands for a moment. I want to say this prophetically, and then I'm done. In a moment, if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold for me. But I want to speak to this. Whenever there is shaking in the earth, whenever there is turmoil and strife and dissension, the enemy looks to prey on the people of God. To pull them away from their convictions with competing philosophies. The day in which I lived or Peter lived, Jesus was surrounded by a host of philosophies and principles that often warred against the intent of the Father which was in heaven. I believe with all my heart that we're living in a similar day. There is division. There is internal unrest in many respects without question, which is justified. But it is not that that is not to be felt. It is what is the kingdom response? How do we honor his majesty, our Lord, and allow him to call the shots in our life? Can I tell you that his disposition as a prophet exposed what was unlike God, which we will never be silent about, that which opposes the will of God, that which oppresses. But notice this. The second thing that God gave him was a strategy. When Christ becomes Lord, we give him everything that we are. We allow him to define our disposition, our interactions. And if it brings division and not the unity of the faith, it's not our God. But in this hour, God is looking for revolutionary spiritual warriors 
who are radically transformed internally by the living God. Here's what Jesus knew. If there is authentic internal transformation, then atmospheric transformation should follow. So here at Antioch, we believe in becoming more like our King, like Christ internally. But we don't stop there. We believe in creating atmospheres that are consistent with the atmosphere of heaven. And what is that? Heaven is an atmosphere absent of opposition to the will of God. There's no pride in heaven. There is no racism in heaven. There is no superiority or inferiority in heaven. The only one that is superior is the one with a name that is above every other name. And while this is not the message, I believe prophetically in this hour we need people who send a frequency of transformation that is motivated by love with divine strategy in the age in which we live. That the glory of God may not only be felt internally, but seen in our homes and seen in our churches and seen across denominational lines and seen in our communities and seen in this nation of ours, seen in this world. And so God, we thank you for making us more like you. And having been transformed lovingly into the image of Christ, creating environments that are more like heaven. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, don't move if you, you haven't begun to walk. If you raised your hand to any of those calls or you wanted to raise your hand, as the prayer counselors come just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to do just two bold things. There are so many of you that raised your hands. Don't leave this place without responding to this call. If you raised your hand to either of those calls, I want to ask you to do something that you may think rude but it's okay I give you permission turn up the lights please if you will just in the words of the vintage hip hop poet by the name of brother Ludacris if you would just elbow your neighbor turn the lights please if you would just elbow your neighbor and tell them move get out my way real quick and if, if you raised your hand or wanted to raise your hand to any of those calls, come on, come on, come on. Just come give, give a brother a hug. Come, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, Antioch. Come on, praise God for them. Praise God. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, let's bless the name of the Lord. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Don't leave, don't leave. Come on, come, come, come. Come, come, come. There's healing, there's transformation, there's renewal, there's family. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, don't, come on, don't stop praying. Don't stop praising God. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, bless the name of the Lord. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Somebody bless his name. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Listen, listen. I need everyone to do this, whether you're a visitor. You may not even be a believer, but I need you to do this. Everyone, find the boniest finger on your hand. Find that. And lift it up, lift it up. The boniest finger on your hand. I want you to take that finger. It may be rude, but I give you permission. And put the boniest finger on your hand in your neighbor's face and ask them was that call for you if they say yes walk down with them if they say no leave them alone come on 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 Well, in the words of the other vintage hip-hop poet, 
by the name of Brother Ice Cube, who declared, no barking from the dog, no smog, and mama cooked the breakfast with no harm. And at the end of these sociological observations, he came to the conclusion that today was a good day. Look at your neighbor, tell him today was a good day. Holler back at him and say, ooh ah, ooh ah, ooh ah, ooh ah, ooh ah. May the peace and blessing of the Lord be with you. And God, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Now we thank you, Lord, for being the love in every believing heart, the peace in every believing mind, the breath in every believing spirit, in the life of every believing soul. And we say, may the saving grace of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of his precious Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide now, henceforth, and forever as we're becoming more like Christ in our environments are becoming more like heaven. It will matter that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.